With social media, we're able to make our lives look however we want them to. Whether or not it's actually true, we can feign happiness and stability. So I'm here today to look behind the handle once again on someone you probably already follow to tell you something about themselves that you probably don't know. This time, Ashley Perez. I'm Ashley Perez. I used to work at BuzzFeed for five years and now I am producing and acting freelance. I do a lot of videos about being awkward or not feeling comfortable in my body, mainly scripted comedy videos that are very physical. So I would say I was known for being a more comedic person online. What do you think people take away from your social media when they look at you? It's interesting because my social media is kind of different everywhere. Like my Twitter is half politics, half jokes. And then my Instagram is like, here's the hottest that I ever look. And it's on Instagram and there's not much humor there unless you're on my story and it's just my cat. And then my YouTube presence is very like funny and silly and open. I think in general, people probably take away from my social media that I am a very happy person. Part of being a public figure is like needing to find the balance of what is private in your own life. People have scrutinized truly every single part of my body down to the veins in my hands. As a layer of protection, you start curating what you want the audience to see versus letting them comment on every single part of you that's real. So at any given point in time, even though I'm being honest about what has happened to me in the past, you probably only know like 60 to 70% of what my actual life is at that moment. What we're talking about today, how many people know this about you? I have cumulatively probably like a million followers on social media and less than 10 people in my life know what I'm about to talk about. Why is it so few? It's just so personal. It's like the most personal thing in my life. It's weird to talk about something and know that a lot of people are gonna see it because even if only 10,000 people watch this video, that's 9,999,000 more people than have ever heard this before. I've done so many videos, but it feels a little bit unsettling. Oh, I can't believe I'm talking about this. It's definitely not in the media, and so I just felt like I must be the only one going through this, and this is like a shameful little secret that I have, and so only my like absolute best friends and family know about it. I've talked about struggles with mental illness before, I've talked about body weight issues, I've talked about not feeling sexy, but for some reason, I think because this seems so weird and specific, I've just never talked about it before. I'm tired of not talking about it, and I know that there are gonna be people who watch this video who do the same thing and will be seen and I want us to have less shame and stigma about it. This is 100% the most private thing about myself. So you know all of this about me, but there is something you don't know about me. I have trichotillomania, which is a hair pulling disorder. The beginning of my hair pulling it just started one day and it didn't stop for like 10 years. One random day in college, I found a scab on my head and I started picking at it and I kept picking from there. I was really concerned with wanting my head to feel smooth, so I had this tiny little bald spot. Wow, this feels so familiar, this feeling. I had this tiny little bald spot and I would just feel like this. And I could feel the tiny, tiny little hairs growing back and those would bother me so much that I would spend hours trying to pick them out until my head was smooth. When I would pick my head, I would go into kind of like a trance-like state. I would always have terrible headaches and migraines. Sometimes I would start bleeding. It would be debilitating, but it felt impossible to not pick. A lot of the relief is from the actual pulling. And so no matter how much I would hurt myself, once I pulled a hair, it felt so relieving that you kept doing it. But another thing that I had to do was take pictures of it I have hundreds of pictures in my camera roll of like trying to get a close-up picture of my hair because since I couldn't see it, I was obsessed with like, what is the thing that is bothering me right now? I remember one night staying up super late with just the flash on trying to get the right angle and I was like, maybe I can turn on my phone, stream it to the TV so I can see it and set up the camera in a way. And then when you realize what you're doing, you feel insane. 
and it feels like, how have I gotten this bad? You do feel sad too that you can't like beat this thing, I guess. It's like pretty easy to hide. You know, I'd be leaning up against my desk or just like this, but really what I was doing was picking my head. I was always sure that everyone knew, but no one knew. Sometimes I would wear hats if it ever got like bad enough. It was always a little bit alarming being around taller people. My ball spot was at the top of my head, so truly, unless you were taller than me, you would. there was no way you would naturally see it. It was always super embarrassing to get my hair cut, and when she would slick my hair down, my little alfalfa hairs of the hairs that had grown back would stick right up, and she'd be like, what's going on here? And I, I feel like she must have known. I think people are just afraid to talk about these things, but I would lie and say that Oh, I hit my head on the cabinet, the straightener burned it, and so now I have a scab. Like, I would just make up all these reasons of why. It's kind of like the same thing of like smelling to see if you have deodorant on. Like, it's pretty impossible to tell right now that I could be picking my head, but that's what I was doing. My friends had no idea that this was something that I was dealing with. But afterward, it was actually really hard to go from being a completely isolated, person to then having my three best friends know about it and then being on my case about it. They were just trying to help me, but it wasn't with the help of an actual therapist. People just trying to have good intentions and being like, don't pick your head. It's like crazy to say to anyone who has a mental illness, don't be depressed, don't have anxiety, don't pick your head, because if it was that easy, then I would have done it. In my brain, I was like, oh yeah, don't pick my head. I just need to have as much willpower as possible. And every time I failed, I felt like I was just a failure or didn't have enough willpower because no one was even talking to me about like the root causes for this kind of disorder. It was treated by me and my friends and family for so long like it was a bad habit. The best way I would describe what my hair pulling feels like to someone who hasn't had a similar obsessive compulsive disorder is if you're ever at home, and it's really quiet, and then all of a sudden, a fly starts buzzing around, and you can hear it. And as much as you want to ignore it, you can hear it, and it's following you. And then you get up, and you try and find it, and you go crazy until you can kill that fly or get it out of the room. I think that's just the beginning of what an obsessive compulsive disorder feels like. Sometimes I would have peace for a couple days because I would get my hair pulling to a point where I was satisfied with it and then all of a sudden here come a hundred more flies and I can't deal with it again and it's just as annoying as the when there was one fly. I started getting a little bit of tennis elbow or carpal tunnel from the repetitive motion of picking at my head because my bald spot is up here. If you go back into old BuzzFeed videos, you can actually see me picking my head. It was so out of control that I couldn't even stop for like the moments that I was on camera. I was picking my head like every 30 seconds probably. When you're looking to treat hair pulling, how did you treat yours? Whew, the treatment is the hardest part, honestly. The first part is recognizing that you have a problem and that it actually is something that needs to be addressed and treated. For me, it was really hard to recognize that I had a mental disorder because I had had histories of mental disorder in my family. And I always just saw this as so much less than that, that I was like, I don't have a mental illness. A mental illness is, that's crazy, you know? It's not this thing. But it was 100% a mental illness. I met with three different therapists over my lifetime, but it was never just for hair pulling. Hair pulling was a larger part of a symptom of a lot of stuff I was dealing with. And it was weird because I felt like, well, I'm here to tackle my hair pulling. I don't want to deal with my whole life, but you really kind of have to deal with the holistic version of yourself. The third time I went to therapy, which was the most helpful, in terms of my hair pulling, I was also dealing with coming out. And so I stopped going to that therapist because I didn't want to admit I was gay. And then that stopped me from dealing with my hair pulling and my hair pulling kind of got worse and worse. And so when I finally came back and I was like, okay, guess what, I'm, you were right, I'm gay, which my therapist was like, yeah. I was able to fully address the issue head on. One of the first thing we tried was replacement therapy, which meant instead of picking my head, I would pick at something else. Lots of different textile things, kinetic sand. My girlfriend got me these magnets that I would like play with. I wore gloves at one point. I had a pair of gloves in my car and at home. Another thing that I tried is medicine. My psychiatrist said that OCD is one of the hardest things to treat medically. I took Lexapro, but then it, it led to other side effects. So I had to go on Wellbutrin, and before I knew it, it made me not feel like myself. What often happens is cognitive behavioral therapy, which has been the only thing that's been helpful for me. 
Cognitive behavioral therapy means a lot of things. I personally have tried 10 to 15 different strategies to see which one works for me. I had to figure out how to change the behavior of what I'm actually doing, putting my hand up and down, and then change the mental state behind it. So the thing that was most helpful to me, basically every time I would pick my head because I couldn't stop doing this, when I was aware that my hand was up there, I would have to stop, leave my hand there, breathe in and out, think about what was making me anxious, take a second, and only when I was ready, put my hand down. And even that is so relaxing. I feel more relaxed than I've been this whole time. Problem is, one and a half seconds later, my hand was here again. And you couldn't just skip and be like, oh, well, I already did my thing. You had to go. <sighs> over and over and over again until your body starts to unlearn the behavior and your body starts to become aware of what you're doing. So I had to start keeping a journal. When am I picking my head? When am I picking it the most? How long am I picking my head for? Is there other things that are making me anxious? It was this slow, terrible process of elimination that took so long for progress that seemed so minute. But just like it started, it very much felt like the first time I stopped picking my head, that just one day I stopped picking my head. But I think it was because I was doing so much small work. After the first time that I got better, I had about a year clean where I didn't relapse. And then I had a scab one day, started picking, and picked for probably another six months. The one thing that really helped me this last time was just putting a tiny little like butterfly clip in my hair right there. And it looked ridiculous, but it stayed so well that I couldn't move it. And every time I would put it up there, it made me immediately conscious of the fact that my hand was up there. And that was the most helpful thing for me in terms of stopping my hair pulling. Once you know what works for you, tell the people who love you what works for you so that they can remind you specifically what you need to do. Sometimes my girlfriend would catch me and be like, do you want to take a breath right now? In a very easy way that wasn't shaming me that wasn't making me feel bad. It was like, oh yeah, I do want to take a breath right now. Thank you. Take a breath and be done with it. It's not always dark and always evil and always this thing that like will bring you down. Even when I was getting better, the experience of having my little hairs grow back in my alfalfas, I was so proud of having it. I would be like, look, my alfalfas are coming back. Oh my God, my hair. And it was like comical. My hair would stick up like this, but it felt like such a big win. It did feel like a hard thing that I went through, but it didn't change who I was fundamentally. Because mental illness is something that we think of as such a bad thing, we often try to just not show it or not talk about it, but that's the most destructive part. Creating a culture of shame where we can't talk about it, and because it's harmful, we don't talk about it, gives it so much more power. So how does it feel now that you've talked about it? This video is gonna be online and everyone's gonna know this thing about me or a lot of people. It feels weird right now because I don't know what the response is gonna be. Part of me feels so much relief in just talking about it and so I would encourage you guys too, you don't have to go through this alone. In fact, you absolutely shouldn't go through this alone. I wanted so desperately for it to be something that I could fix myself, but it is a mental disorder and you need help. It doesn't make you a weirdo and it doesn't make you an oddball. It's just a normal thing that there are people and professionals who can help you and that if you stick with it, you will get better eventually. I think that's great. That's all folks. Man, I need to pee. <laughs> cool, let's go ahead and cut. Cut. For more information, resources, and support groups for trichotillomania, check out the links in the description below. There are people out there who want to help you. You got this. Hey, Unsolved is on a new channel, and now your part. Subscribe, Subscribe here. here. That was my part. <laughs>